Well, like I said, you know, we went through a state of emergency in 2007-8, and uh, this was one of the things I saw happening. You know, uh, there was this military-backed regime which uh, was allegedly uh, very intent on running anti-corruption campaigns, um, arresting people by the thousands, uh, holding many of them uh, for months without bail, and many other things like that happening. And many of the people that they did arrest were uh, very likely corrupt or crooked, especially the politicians, some of the businessmen, some of the bureaucrats. But my uh, quarrel was with the uh, method of the way they were going about it. Uh, you know, sus effectively suspending and trampling on all civil rights. So, but the, one of the other things that happened at the time that I watched was on the one hand there were people who uh, were very uh, in favor of this kind of a regime and the quote clean up it was doing and there were people who were unhappy with it because they became the victims or they felt vulnerable and on both sides there was both uh, ideals and also uh, issues of personal interest that made them choose which side they were on. Um, nobody was necessarily uh, for the campaign out of pure ideal that was going to fight corruption and a lot of those people were also beneficiaries of this new regime. And those who were uh, against it were of course certainly not beneficiaries and often uh, quite badly treated. Uh, and so they would clamp onto, uh, clutch onto, you know, ideals of civil rights and whatever to oppose the regime, but that also wasn't a pure uh, uh, sort of uh, struggle. And uh, the third thing that happened was in this situation, you know, uh, friends who until then uh, as part of a social order were maybe on the same side uh, politically as in they could even choose different parties but there wasn't a stark difference uh, in, in their own lives and how they interacted but this situation once you chose to be with the regime or, or you chose not to be or were effectively put uh, against the regime uh, it started affecting uh, personal friendships and relationships and to me that was interesting that uh, how a state gets reorganized can uh, so quickly percolate down to networks of long-standing personal relationships and, and the tensions that arise. So yeah. that's what I was really interested in exploring. Where did the title of the book come from? Was this your own invention? It was my own invention and it just popped into my head one day. Uh, it wasn't something I thought about for a long time. You know, I just looked at all these men who were in power in that moment, uh, generals and others, other officers, uh, men who had been in power until very recently, men who were supremely powerful and were now suddenly finding themselves in a really, you know, dreadful, dank little uh, prison cell with no idea when they would get out. And this idea that you could have the world in your hands and uh, lose it so drastically and so quickly and that everybody was trying to have it. And it's, it's also meant to be a sort of double meaning. You know, there is the desire to get the entire world in our hands. And there is also whether we're attentive to the world that is in our hands, opposed to the, as opposed to the whole of it. Now, one of the two lead male characters in the book is a newspaper man. The other is a wealthy, property developer who doesn't fare so well, um, not to give too much of right. at this point. But, is there a part of you in each of them, if at all? Or you know, the based on people you know, are there any people banging down your door, uh, annoyed at having recognized themselves in the book? I've been um, advised by friends who write and uh, my publisher or editors that I should, uh, if I were asked this question, always say, all characters in this book are completely uh, uh, invented and any resemblance to any particular <laughs> and not only the two lead male characters, yeah. but the lead female character also has a lot of me uh, in her. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that you know male writers can't be in the female and vice versa. Uh, in fact, I personally identify with the female character more than anybody else in terms of her uh, quiet determination and uh, sort of this strong uh, will. So all her good, her good uh, personality traits are all yours? Yeah, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> Now, when we're coming up to the female characters, and as I said, we were going to talk about this, I, of course, pay extra attention to uh, the women in this book, as I want to do with most books. And if 
If I didn't know if it, that it was satire, if I didn't know that all the good qualities were here of yours, I'd say that you were skirting pretty close to some stereotypes of female, sort of South Asian female characters. Sure. I know this is something that's been talked about before. Um, did your treatment in creating these female characters differ than, say, your treatment in creating the male characters? Um, no, not really. I mean, I was really looking at the uh, structure of the story and the contest that's uh, playing out in the story and uh, who gets to play what kind of uh, role in that structure of contest. Right. Uh, and not really thinking that, oh, is this a typical... I mean, strictly speaking, the, the male characters are quite typical South Asian characters as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's not just the women who are typical. I don't deny that the women are typical, but the men are typical as well. My, my crime is one of the... You know, inventing the characters are typical, not, not imposing typicality on women exclusively. Um, because, you know, the men are powerful. To me, what was interesting is to write about people that I felt had not been written about, which is to say, uh, my main characters are this, you know, extremely rich uh, real estate tycoon, the deputy editor of a paper who is desperate to become the editor, um, this uh, tycoon's wife, who also runs an um, NGO of herself, uh, that takes care of street children, and also there's another woman who is a what we uh, think of as a, I guess a immigrants uh, in this case a unborn American woman who's come back to do good in the old country. Um, but men like uh, and the director of the uh, intelligence agency, I think men like Hassan Kaiser Bhatia when they're treated uh, in novels, they often come come uh, across as one-dimensional or two-dimensional characters who are invariably, uh, you know, bad people. And I was really interested to look at these people uh, as complex characters. Uh, you know, one of the things is, you know, we talk about uh, in literature that uh, it leaves a lot of people out. And I, I, I think when people say that, people usually think of people who are politically or socially disenfranchised. But given about 60 or 70 odd years of uh, a strong socialistic uh, influence in the sensibility of our writing, we actually have a preponderance of writing in the vernaculars. I know that it's true in Bangla, I don't know if it's the case in Urdu, but I suspect it's the case in Urdu where people who themselves are not necessarily from the subaltern, but who are middle class, who went to college, who you know probably joined the student wing of the Communist Party, then went on and had a middle class gig as a journalist, and they wrote about the downtrodden. And we have tons of writing of the downtrodden, but we don't have uh, attempts at creating complex characters out of uh, people who actually have made these places what they have after. Uh, the people in power, people who've been in politics, people who have been... But you know, in world literature, you have uh, characters from Tolstoy to Pynchon, you have, uh, or Delilo, you have in American writing and English writing, people write about everybody. Uh, the way I see uh, uh, literature, you know, uh, all people from all strata of society, all orientations of politics, sexuality, what have you, spirituality, have a place in literature. I don't know why South Asian writing has to be by the middle class, for the upper class, about the lower class. Uh, so I wrote about the upper class and I know people from all classes will someday read it. Well, let's talk a little bit about your writing process as well while we're on the subject of of the content that you created. What came first for you? The plot, the characters, the setting? To the opening line. Really? For me, most uh, stories, most things I write just start with the opening line. And did the opening line stay the same? Yeah. The yeah. yeah. Do, you want, just wrote, do you want to read us the I'm opening sure. line? I'll, I'll read the opening line and the paragraph too, so it gives a better, better sense of how it opens. All great success, like all true failure, is ultimately a thing of mystery. One discovers principles and causalities post facto. One imposes order and progressions on the most spectacular of fates and detects patterns that may or may not exist. Here was the formula that anyone could follow to execute a meteoric rise. Believe in yourself, wait with the dawn, never give up, make a daily list, aim then, be a maverick. Hissam Habib, deputy editor of the Daily Pandava, man of flatters with a pungent wit and deep-seated heresies, and also a possessor of ambitions as huge and hidden as his anxieties knew it all. He had in fact tried it all. Lately he had acquired a taste for tracts of self-improvement. The power of yes, how to get to the top and stay there, only the paranoid survive. These books were of course never displayed. The walls of Hassam's library 
were girded with great force, while his office was stacked with the dreariest form of all literature, thick neck reports on development from around the world. Everything he owned, he had read, in his youth he truly believed in the significant branches of knowledge, albeit with a partiality to philosophy and literature and respectable not to history and the sciences. If those subjects contained any answers though, they were revealed with excruciating slowness and indirection, and that was the luxury for which he no longer had the time. Hence his recent reliance on self-help manuals, this cachet of secret wisdom, along with his talk of rogging and classic pornography, in the vernacular, he kept hidden in his bedroom. Thank you. Now, have you ever read self-help books? I've kind of been asked if I've read classic pornography. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I don't have to presume that one, but no. <laughs> yes, I've read. Uh, no, I'm asking about Rogaine either. Uh, which she <laughs> didn't want this for me. But um, I have, uh, uh, yeah, I've read self-help books. Um, Partly because uh, when it comes to reading, I'm an absolute uh, omnivore. I'll read anything. Uh, glossy magazines, classics, uh, I, whatever I get out of my hands on, I'll read it. Yeah. Any favorite self-help books? Uh, only only, only the Paranoid Survive, which is a real book by a former CEO of um, um, which company made the Pentium? Uh, the chips, the chip maker? Sorry. Intel. Intel. Intel, yes. Thank you. Um, the CEO of Intel wrote this uh, fantastic book called Only the Paranoid Survive. Um, I, I wish I could have used that title, but um, I, I liked it enough that I read the book and it was very interesting. And what he talked about was uh, technology and uh, how technology industries will go through more radical changes more swiftly than any other, and that's Only the Paranoid Survive. And I think recently we've seen that with the effective um, obsolescence of Nokia. Right. So, yeah, well, I, I, I do read. I guess, strictly speaking, that's not a self help book, but I treated it in that category because it was supposed to, uh, I guess, at least give me better managerial skills, right. which is yet to be proven. Well, as Kurt Cobain said, just because you're paranoid it doesn't mean they're not after you. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, you chose to uh, call the city that your novel is set in, not Dhaka. Yeah. You chose not to name Bangladesh. Um, reasons specific for doing this? Two reasons. One is uh, psychologically, I felt that uh, having this very thin veil uh, freed me up to talk about things uh, in a way that I uh, would have otherwise felt maybe inhibited about. Right. And you know, I've actually been uh, writing um, from a very young age, from 19, and uh, contrary to my uh, extraordinary youthful books. I'm actually in my 40s now. <laughs> and uh, it's taken me a long time to get to the point where I could write what I, I felt I really wanted to write, what I really wanted to say. And more than anything else, I thought I was held back by worries always about, oh, this will offend my father, this will offend the uh, army intelligence, this will offend politicians, that will offend friends. And I think that kind of feeling of uh, uh, inhibition, censorship not of the state, but censorship of being in society is stronger in South Asia than it is in some places, especially in the West. Um, and you know, there, there are many reasons for it, which all of you I'm sure are aware of. And uh, for me, uh, you know, I have friends who write who somehow managed to overcome that much more quickly than I did, but in my case it took time. And this device was a good device to finally sort of break through that. The other thing was, I, it is ultimately a fictional story. You know, the actual emergency lasted two years. In my novel, it lasts only one year. And uh, I didn't want people to read this book as some kind of a, a, a reportage on the actual emergency that happened. Rather, I wanted to explore uh, basically the human mind and human relations in extremists under, under, under you know, strong conditions. And I felt that this device would help people not so much look for one-to-one -one correspondence between what's happened in the story and what happened in real life, but focus on the internal dynamics of the story and the characters. Yeah. You just mentioned that you've been writing from a very early age, and you're part of a family that's involved in publishing uh, newspapers. Was there some sort of inevitability to your writing and becoming a, a novelist? Uh, not at all. Uh, my father, uh, is an engineer by training, and uh, he actually trained in Lahore uh, in the early 60s. 
It used to be called Lahore uh, uh, Engineering University, which I believe now is called Pakistan University of Engineering and Technology. He was a student from, I think, 1959 to 63, and then he lived here uh, for another 10 years. Uh, my mother, after marrying him, also came and lived here in 1969. And I grew up hearing stories about Lahore, and that was one of my main attractions for coming to this festival. The, the instant I was uh, invited, I, I said yes, because I had never been to Pakistan before, and I really wanted to come see Lahore. And uh, I actually brought my mother with me so she could take me around and show me the old places where they lived and so on. But my father was an engineer who then left the army and, and you know, uh, founded a business. So I grew up, you know, a typical South Asian male in a uh, solvent uh, business family with a lot of uh, perceived pressure on me to uh, become a useful person, you know, uh, become an engineer and, and uh, maybe do an MBA and run a business. There was no active encouragement or prompt from anyone to go into writing. But luckily for me, uh, my parents never uh, actively opposed it either. Well, she's the one's right here. There's not much else you can say. Yeah, I'm never taking her to a festival again. <laughs> <laughs> if you start asking her questions. Enjoy this trip. It could be your last. <laughs> but no, it's one. But you do run a business as well. I do. Yeah. yeah. Let's go back to the book for a second. It's obviously going to resonate very well. You know, uh, military emergency, all the rest of it. Pakistanis, we are familiar with this with this concept. As I said when you read the first. Uh, first portion you read from the yeah. book, it's something very familiar to all of us. Were you actively thinking of, say, you know, military situations in other South Asian countries as well when you wrote this, or was it all very much stemming from your own experience of what Bangladesh went through? You know, uh, going back to the theme of paranoia, as I said, I uh, started writing in my 20s, and in my 20s I actually wrote a novel that Bangladesh uh, returned to democracy in 91, and I finished a novel in 98 which imagine a new democracy that suddenly collapses and there's an emergency. At the time, for a variety of reasons, I didn't do a good job with the novel and I didn't push it. <coughs> and I, you know, uh, got uh, sidetracked into other uh, uh, work and then I came back into writing with uh, short stories. And then when I wrote this novel, I didn't have the former uh, novel in mind at all. I just wanted to write the kind of story I wanted to write and, and this emergency that we've gone through and, and what it showed. But the funny thing is, um, I felt that the political structure in our country was weak enough that it was vulnerable to uh, this kind of an intervention. Um, and that was something I had, that, that's a worry that was always on my mind as to my you know, first unpublished novel would uh, sort of testify. And then eventually it actually happened. And we went through the experience, and now I was on the other side of it. It was no longer an imagined or anticipatory fear, but a, a fear or frightening situation that had been lived through. So that's what really fueled my writing here. I wasn't really thinking about other um, nearby uh, situations. Although I'm sure that, uh, you know, again, I, I'm a big believer in structural reasons of things. So what, what happens here I'm sure will have some. Uh, resonance or, or sense of familiarity to people in Pakistan who have also seen their uh, military uh, ruled periods. You mentioned just uh, before we started that you write in Burma as well, but you write non fiction, you write op eds, journalism. Yeah. Um, what's that like? Is this how it's going to be? Do you keep on the for non fiction? Do you write op in English? Is the process behind both writing both languages very different for you? My relationship to these two languages is very odd. Uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that the uh, majority of South Asians who write in English do so because English really is their first language for whatever reasons. At home they speak English, they've gone to English medium, education and so on and so forth. In my case, uh, I grew up in a home that was uh, bilingual, but Bangla was very much our first language and I went through 12 years of Bangla medium schooling. I, I did not go through English medium, I did do O's and A's. Um, eventually, I went to America and I studied in university there. So when I started writing in a, a, a college, meaning a, a university in America, actually for the first two and a half years, I wrote in Bangla. I wrote short stories, and the only person in the university who could read Bangla was my brother. So I'd write these stories, and I'd show it to them. And uh, my brother and I were only a year apart. So, you know, there's that kind of brotherly bond. So he would freely tell me, this is crap. 
Um, so I would take the stories and be told it's crap, and I would then go write another story. Um, and after two and a half years, you know, finally I kind of swallowed my pride and I decided, okay, I've got only one term left and this wonderful writer is here like I'm not white. Uh, I'm clearly not a prodigy, I might as well go take a course on uh, how to write. But to get into the course, I had to write something in English and my brother read that and said, this is terrific, this is wonderful. So completely by accident, I became a writer in English and since then I've written fiction in English. But I'm completely comfortable in Bangla and I write uh, op-eds, columns, whatever criticisms uh, in Bangla for the papers there. Now, you're also a publisher of the Literary Journal, so I had to ask, where's the English writing in Bangladesh right now? And just the session before this, uh, that you were on a panel talking about the, the global novel. What does that mean for a Bangladeshi writer? I think for all writers, first and foremost, uh, uh, writing a global novel means that you've uh, sold a bazillion copies of your novel. And that's why everyone would like to have written a global novel. But uh, that aside, uh, the English writing coming of Bangladesh is still very new and it's uh, still uh, somewhat formatted. Uh, Bangladesh is not nearly as anglophone as India. And uh, my, I suspect not even as much as Pakistan. Uh, you know, it's only my first time there. I've spent only two days and in the context of this festival. But I still get the sense that you know there is a, a stronger tradition of uh, English in Pakistan than there is in Bangladesh, where you know we struggle for our language and everything. So there's a lot of pride in that, and there's been a lot of emphasis and investment in Bangla. And uh, unlike India, and Pakistan, uh, even in Pakistan, I believe uh, English is still you know very much a language of business and, and governance and so on. I, I just learned that your civil service exams are in English. In Bangladesh, the civil service exams are in Bangla. The lower courts operate in Bangla. You know, the, the, the degree to which Bangla is used. I don't think other vernaculars are used in state functions and in society and in writing. So the English, uh, you know, we are, we are newer to English. There's, there's a new generation that's coming up. But I think there is some, uh, uh, I, I think it's, it's definitely going to be a part of that terrain. Um, unfortunately, we've lost a number of other languages uh, over time, but I hope uh, we don't lose this one. All right, now we have a few minutes left before we take questions. I want to quickly ask about your next novel, which is set in New York, and it's about foolies. And you and I had a, a conversation on the radio last week, but yes. I said, well, that's a little pretentious. People who talk about food form and food chemistry and physics, and, and you agreed. I do, yeah, yeah. I agree. Tell me then about this next novel that's, uh, that you're writing. Um, it's going to be set in New York, which is a city where I lived for a long time. I love it. It's the city of my soul. Uh, I, I just love New York, so I wanted to write about New York. And I want to write not just about foodies, I want to write about extreme foodies. People who start really, really the really pretentious ones, then. The really pretentious ones and the really adventurous ones. And I, I figured that from what I've seen and what I know of New York, to me they seem like the ultimate characters through whom to uh, explore the, the diversity, the appetites, the velocity, uh, everything of New York. And also I think, you know, uh, I, I don't write with an intention of getting moral or political, I just, you know, focus on the characters and then those issues emerge. But I think, uh, you know, this whole business of appetites, you know, people needing to, you know, find peacocks and discover or rediscover Roman recipes of how to cook them, um, we'll, we'll speak uh, well to this moment of uh, hyper-consumption uh, globally, this culture of hyper-consumption. And uh, when should we expect that? No pressure. Um, well, thanks to my editors, I've now really learned to write fast. So <laughs> hopefully not uh, a decade or two, uh, a year or two. Uh, any questions for Anis? Is there anyone? Gentlemen right there. Um. This, the, the, this whole plot, as you said, is set up in this um, military dictatorship and the coup. Um, and both our countries have gone through military as well as civil dictatorship. And when you talk about, you know, we have prime ministers of our gods and military dictators of our gods. Um, so would the plot or the context of the characters change in a civilian dictatorship or are they very specific to this military coup? Uh, it's definitely very specific to the military period. And in Bangladesh, there is a, 
there's a significant difference between uh, how things were under uh, the military regime in those two years versus when we have civilian elected governments. Uh, because for most, uh, you know, there is no suspension of civil rights. I mean, even, yes, you can get politically targeted in Bangladesh right now, Amelie is in power, um, somebody in BNB uh, for the same crime is much more likely to get arrested than somebody from Amelie. But they will be produced in court within two days. They may not get bail right away, but eventually they will after two weeks. But under the military regime, there was no recourse. I just wanted to ask that, um, do you think that in Desi writing there's probably a more of a tradition to be literary fiction than popular? And by popular I mean things like books where everything is spelled out for you, like Stephanie Meyer or something. I'm not saying that's a bad thing that Desi writers don't have an equivalent to that. But any writer that you see from the subcontinent area, there's always a lot of, it involves a lot of engagement with the text on the reader's part. So do you see this as a trend, like why, like, I don't know, I just feel that there's not a lot of spelled out popular fiction coming from the subcontinent. Not a lot of commercial fiction. Yeah, so I was just wondering why do you think that happens? I, I think that's an excellent question. I myself see that as a deficiency of our uh, written culture, of our reading culture. Uh, I, I think there should be uh, more popular writing, and I myself don't uh, look down on so-called popular writing at all. Like I said, you know, I'm a... Uh, when it comes to reading, I'm polymorphously perverse. I'll read anything, um, and especially thrillers. Uh, I, I like reading them. And uh, first of all, I don't look down upon them because uh, anyone who thinks uh, popular fiction is easy to write should first try writing. Uh, should writing, try writing anything. Uh, one of the things I've learned through 20 years of trying to write is that uh, most people have no idea how it is, how hard, how much hard work it is to write even a quote bad novel. You know, so it's a lot of work, and uh, writing the so-called popular fiction itself uh, takes a particular kind of skill. It's not something uh, that we so-called literary writers could necessarily do at will. Just as doing the kind of work we do is one kind of skill, doing that kind of writing is another kind of skill. Now to answer why it is, I, I don't know that I should presume to speak for all of South Asia which has so many languages and different cultures and for all I know there may be some writers who are very popular in their own vernaculars. In Bangladesh for example there was this writer called uh, Mayan Ahmed who passed away just uh, a couple of years ago. He was incredibly popular. Uh, his books would sell 100,000 copies in the, in, you know, in the first year. Uh, but why we had only one my Ahmed and why we didn't have 10 more writers who could also sell even half as many copies uh, of the books that he wrote is something that has always uh, puzzled me and by the same token why the literary writers often tend to have such confined readership is also something that uh, uh, bothers me a little uh, and I think it's because for us literature has actually been uh, in our own traditions uh, our literature uh, comes, you know, from the priests and the courts, if you really go back to the history. And even in modern times, uh, Bengali itself is uh, very much, modern Bengali is an invention of the colonial uh, era. It was uh, effectively uh, given its modern shape and form, the grammar, and the, uh, by uh, English uh, priests in Fort William in, in Calcutta. And so, it, even in colonial times, it was a language of a new elite uh, who were the colonial elite. And I don't think we've gone far enough from those elite roots to where we speak in a language, in an actual vernacular idiom. I, I feel that our, since I'm someone who writes in both languages, Bangla and English, I feel that uh, in Bangla we still tend to be um, much closer to a very formal kind of writing. And uh, the written work is farther uh, away apart, or, or farther apart from the colloquial uh, spoken language than uh, English tends to be. Uh, this idea that there is, you know, in, in a lot of languages, I believe it's the case in Arabic as well. I don't know Arabic, but friends who do have told me that written Arabic is sort of something very beautiful and formal, and I don't know if it's the case in Urdu, whereas spoken is, is quite distinctly uh, a, a little different. And I think that's a bridge we should close. Uh, I, I myself, in writing Bangla, I do tend to go back to trying to write fiction in Bangla. And actually, what I would love more than anything else is to write popular fiction in Bangla, something that will be read and received by many people. Make sure your brother likes it first. <laughs>
Uh, I'm not going to run it by. Sorry, I, I, I think I'll have a question first. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, you mentioned Edmund Barton. I wondered whether you had actually studied with them. I did. And I did. Were the things you particularly learned or had to unlearn from Edmund White? He's a very particular kind of writer and teacher. Yeah, um, Edmund um, White is an American writer uh, who has written a number of uh, uh, wonderful and, and even landmark novels. He's a gay writer uh, and he's written very extensively about being gay. Uh, especially his book, uh, A Boy's Own Story, was sort of a revelation for the American reading public, and then The Beautiful Room Was Empty, which is my favorite book, talks sort of about the Stonewall uh, uh, incident, which really led to the whole uh, gay rights movement and so on. He, uh, of all the uh, writers I had the chance to study with, uh, I also went to a creative writing program in St. Louis, where I had teachers like uh, William Gass, Stanley Alkin, and met a lot of visiting writers. Um, of all the people I've ever had a chance to study with, Edmund was the best. Uh, he was so open, so honest. You know, writers, when you ask them uh, about process of technique, um, they will say uh, that, oh, it's too hard to describe, which is true, it's a very complex process. And you know, they'll share one or two techniques, but they won't uh, share their deepest techniques uh, of how they generate stories, you know. How, uh, for example, uh, Really smart plagiarism can be turned into a generative technique, um, which you know, in, in, in uh, uh, better terms, is called uh, influence. Uh, <laughs> but no, jokes aside, I mean, Edmund White was just so open and generous with uh, how he talked about writing and his own method. I was really struck, and because that was my benchmark, I could see that other writers didn't talk, and he gave useful tips, like you know, as a, as a young writer, you're not sure where ideas come from, you know. He taught us that trust your memory, you know, as Joyce says, memory is imagination, but how to access memory and, and how to transform it. It's not reportage on memory, but how taking, you take it as a springboard. So he, he talked about that, he, uh, and he would get so technical. Like one of the things I learned from him is, he said, you know, the problem with uh, young writers is they'll write a scene and they'll make it so static that it reads like a catalog of what you see. But in reality, when you see a room, when you first enter, you are actually bombarded with images near and far. You know, you just pick up on random things. And you have to be able to know how to, what the critical details are and how to create that impression. Uh, then he taught us about uh, what he called light rushing, and that's something apparently Namakov did, where, uh, where prose or things can get too dense, and you need to know when and where and how to lighten it. So there was so much stuff like that, and it really stayed with me. Because it was a splendid experience. Sorry, I think somebody Sabah had a question here first. Hi, I, I wanted to ask, uh, because you work as a journalist, um, and you talked a little bit earlier about personal politics and, and the role that it plays. I think I'm quite out. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so um, the question I wanted to ask was that, obviously your personal politics, I mean, you, you, you write politics, so maybe you can sort of express your personal opinion on politics then. But obviously, as a reporter, did you find that it was easier to talk about, to discuss, or to influence your character's personal politics based on your own when you were writing this book? Or did you, uh, or did you still feel that you had, I mean, obviously, with the thing as, as sensitive as military dictatorship, I suppose if you had somebody who's very sympathetic to a military dictatorship, it might stand at odds with your own uh, personal politics. Did you feel it was easier to, um, to sort of shift from, uh, you know, as an objective journalist to writing an author, especially with, with a subject like this? Um, first of all, strictly speaking, um, I'm uh, not a reporter. I've been a publisher and a columnist. So, um, but yes, I mean, the question still stands. Uh, I, I didn't find a problem going from uh, my uh, columns, which speak uh, explicitly about political issues, um, versus going into the novel and the way it treats a, a situation. Because the focus was very different. You know, when I'm writing a column, a political column, the focus is on the um, actual uh, pressing issues of the moment and talking about it very analytically and trying to take a side or what I believe to be the right side, that sort of uh, discussion. Uh, whereas over here, the focus was much more on these individual characters and what's happen happening to them. I mean, my main character, Hassan, is somebody who actually takes the side of the regime and I try to you know, bring him out uh, sympathetically as well. Yeah. So it was more about uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, so, I was just wondering, because I don't know yeah. what your personal politics are, but um, I was just wondering, is it easy to write a character then? <laughs> or it might be at odds with your own personal politics. 
Um, oh, okay, I see your question. And uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. And actually, uh, I feel that uh, being at, can you hear me? Being at odds with the character was very important to generate the fiction. Right. You know, for me, the lesson here was say something like, uh, Dostoevsky's uh, brother Skarmazov, you know, he says uh, he didn't really get going on that novel until he got to the Grand Inquisitor. Like, he had to figure out the Grand Inquisitor to figure out the whole novel. I, I don't think fiction works if you can't fully imagine yourself into the skin of your quote opponents. I think we have time for one last question. So, my question is, what is the difference, uh, what is the difference between Bangladesh and Pakistan? <laughs> How, no, and I put, Due to geopolitics, geostrategics, uh, this concern geopolitics and geostrategic, they are the military regimes come again and again. How you calculated this difference? Why they came here in Bangladesh and why it came in Pakistan? Well, that's a big question, you know. Uh, but I'll, I'll do my best. And you know, what I say is, uh, you know, sort of my personal opinion. And, and with the proviso also that I certainly know Bangladesh much better than I know Pakistan. But uh, we have had very different histories. Uh, obviously, uh, leading up to 71 and then since 71. 71 to 91, we were effectively under one form or another of uh, what the gentleman here called civil dictatorship, but mostly military dictatorship from 75 to 91. Since 91, we've had democracy except the two-year interregnum. Whereas in Pakistan, which also, I believe, returned to democracy around 91, um, since then you've had a much longer period of uh, military rule. Um, apart from that kind of uh, temporal uh, duration, difference of temporal duration of military rule, I think what's different between the two countries as far as I can read it is that because of the way the two countries and their histories have evolved, in Bangladesh there has been tremendous uh, sort of you know, politically we are so divided as a nation, and on, on certain political and historic issues there is such, such deep uh, uh, fissures. For example, even, uh, even within Bangladesh we are still, you know, divided over the legacy of 1971. You know, uh, people are being tried for war crimes, is that right, is that wrong, is it being done fairly? Those debates are uh, very much alive and very, very, uh, uh, sort of, uh, charged, emotionally charged, politically charged. But one thing on which Bangladeshis have had tremendous consensus is on the need for social development. So, Ahmadinej BNP, they have alternated in power and where the politics or political issues were different, they have scrapped the other's policy cases that this one had started, that one had stalled. But on the social issues, whatever uh, measures have been taken, whatever has been put in place, they, you know, uh, BNP is considered to be the more conservative party, but they never uh, walked away from the policies of uh, uh, education for women. Uh, whatever policies were already in place, if anything, they also added to that, and a variety of other things. Uh, from what I understand, you know, Pakistan, of course, also I'm sure has has it has had its social uh, policies for uh, development and so on. But even in terms of expenditure, uh, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm told uh, that you know uh, uh, fairly significant percentage of your uh, expenditure of, of your percentage of the GDP goes into military spending. Um, and by comparison, uh, less goes to education. Someone was telling me yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to check it out, that uh, over six percent goes to military spending, less than two percent goes to education. In Bangladesh, it's the reverse. Uh, education gets the highest allocation, followed by health followed by infrastructure and power, and then military spending in Bangladesh for the last 20 years has averaged about 1.8% of the GDP spending on military. So, you know, money matters. What you put money into becomes important. So, in Bangladesh, this kind of social investment has led to a certain kind of uh, human development which also makes uh, military intervention uh, harder, and that's why I think we have had only one intervention and it couldn't last. In Pakistan, I don't know, I don't have the answer for your country, but I wonder if, um, you know, more investment in social development wouldn't be one of many things that need to happen for democracy to have a stronger basis. Thank you, Elise. I think uh, we've run out of time now, but just to let everyone know, Elise's novel, The World in My Hands, is available at the booksellers. Uh, 
in four two. Sorry. We have done really. Do are there any questions? Oh, there are. Oh, let's go back to questions. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. This is actually for aspiring writers. Um, sure. We should the current books that I think and the biggest talk that you just gave on global books. I was actually curious to know because we were talking about um, there's that concept, write what you know, generally, that's given to all aspiring writers. But for example, your book seems to be based on writing what you know, and the future book, I think, is also based on your experiences in New York to a certain extent. But we also talked about Kazu Ishiguru in the last uh, debate, and we were talking about Never Let It Go, and we were talking about how to write a book like that. And I was actually curious to know, since you work with Mr. White, who I also really admire, so I was curious to you know, um, besides research, you can do into like a place that you don't know or people you don't know. What else kind of steps can you take to put yourself in the mindset of like the place and people that you yourself have not met or experienced? If you have any uh, advice or ideas? Um, sure, I'll, I'll sh share uh, my thoughts on it, how, how much they'll uh, help you. I don't know, but I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, I mean, you know. Uh, I feel uh, right to you, uh, what you know is a tautological and uh, unhelpful statement because uh, by the time you've written it, whatever you've written, you know that. So you can't, in theory, ever have written anything that you didn't know. Uh, but but we, we, you know, common sense, we understand what it means. Um, and and it, is, yeah, it is true that you should know what you write about. And there's two ways of uh, knowing it. One is that it comes from your lived experience. So for example, if you've grown up in Lahore, you live in Lahore, you know the city, that research is already done. Whereas someone who has always lived in Karachi, if they choose to put uh, even a portion of, uh, of a novel or a story in Lahore, uh, ideally they should come visit and, and see it for themselves and certainly read up on it or ask people who know about it. Um, professional writers, especially those who write uh, commercial fiction, um, and because a certain kind of requirement of getting certain uh, feel uh, right is uh, slightly less uh, stringent with commercial fiction, the really skillful writers, they will be able to write about places that they've not been to. I actually had a very funny experience about that uh, at Jaipur Lit Festival, where I, was, uh, where I went a month ago, and I was in the author's lounge, and uh, Jonathan Franzen showed up, and so I went up to him, um, you know, uh, being starstruck and uh, wanting to, and, and you know, all my psychophantic uh, uh, pulses kicking in. I went up to him and said, you know, I really enjoyed your first book, uh, but I, I, you know, one thing that struck me is in your first book, you wrote a book set in St. Louis, and this comes back to what you're uh, asking about knowing. Uh, he wrote a novel about St. Louis in the 90s, where, uh, about a fictional St. Louis, where he made the chief of police an Indian woman. And then in his latest novel, one of the key characters is also an Indian woman. So I said, you know, like, dude, what's up with Indian women and you? Like, is, I didn't put it quite like that, but you know, I was sort of being cheeky and asking him, like, we had a fascination with India, I didn't specify Indian women. And uh, he said, no, actually, you know, this is my first time in India. I said, oh, okay. He says, I like writing about places before I go to them. And, uh, you know, I, I, I liked what he said because what it means is he is stressing the importance of being able to imagine places. So it's a, it's a give and take between how you imagine a place, how you cast it, but there's also a certain kind of detail that you have to get to right and, and, you know, the touch and feel of the place, especially if you're writing in the vein of realism and you're really trying to represent that place because otherwise it becomes jarring for people who know the place, you know. But apart from that, knowing uh, uh, the place, you know, you can know it by experience, by research, but what type of research? And what I would uh, encourage you to do is, if you're writing a story, focus on the, uh, what I like to think of as the structure of contest in the story, on, on your characters. And when it comes to the research part, uh, what you're writing, ask, questions that are pertinent to your scenes and not the topic in general. And I'll give you a quick little example. Uh, this short story I wrote, Good Night Mr. Kissinger, is about a Bangladeshi waiter in New York who loses his father in the 71 war. And like so many people in the world uh, who hold uh, Kissinger responsible for various wars and genocides, he does the same thing. And one day, lo and behold, he's working in this posh restaurant, Kissinger walks into the restaurant. And uh, the waiter is a bit uh, of a crackpot as well, and basically he goes into this whole moral dilemma of whether he should serve this man food or just stab him, you know, take revenge. So that's what my short story is about. 
And someone asked me, like, did you, how did you research for it? I said, not the politics, not the history, because that's kind of known. That's the, the structure of contest in that story. What I researched extensively for that story was how New York restaurants uh, work. I wanted to make sure I got that right, the kind of lingo used by the waiters. So, you know, what would be on the menu? What would be the price? What is served how? So you have to get that sort of thing right, you know, so that your scenes have that feeling of, for the reader to feel that they're really becoming a must in that place or that situation. To be not, you know, to add to not being, I don't know if it's going to be helpful now, but it was either Stephen King or Robert Silverberg who said, when it comes to writing what you know, if you want to write about space, but you know about plumbing, then write about a plumber in space. <laughs> because it'll still work itself out somewhere. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else? Like, do we have... Do we have time? We do not have time. Alright, so let me get back to my original comment. Thank you, Anise. Thank you. And thank you everyone who's in the audience. Anise's book, uh, The World of My Hands, is available at the Booksellers Hall in Hall 2, and it's date set up right in front where you will be leading him to to sign any copies of the books uh, that you purchased then. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Very special thanks to an audience that feels to come and see an unknown Bangladeshi at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.